Hello everybody, I'm Fright from Frightopia, and welcome back to yet another video. Today we will be talking about three of the biggest cold cases that were solved in 2022. So yeah, I'm going to keep this intro short. Uh, all I ask is that when talking about these cold cases, you keep it respectful to the families of those involved. And uh, yeah, I want to thank you guys for an awesome 2022. I promise to be way more consistent in 2023. And uh, I'm excited to see, you know, what this year has to us. And I hope... 2023 is good to you guys as well. So yeah, once again, I'm Fright from Frightopia, and let's get into the video. Boy in the Box On February 25th, 1957, the body of a small boy was found inside of a box in the woods off of Susquehanna Road in Fox Chase, Philadelphia. This boy that was found in the box was found unclothed and wrapped in a plaid blanket, and he was believed to be dead for days. However, investigators cannot figure out how many days exactly the boy had been dead because it was cold outside which slows the decomposition process. The body was first found by a young man who was checking his muskrat traps in the woods and this young man actually did not tell the police about this because he was worried that when the police came up to investigate the young boy's body uh, they would take his muskrat traps away. A few days later a college student was driving down the road he saw a rabbit run into the woods and this college student knew that there were a lot of traps and stuff in the woods, so he went to go follow the rabbit. He stumbled across the body in the woods and was too scared to tell the police. However, a day later, he reported it to the police when he heard about the disappearance of Mary Jane Barker in New Jersey. When investigators arrived, they took note of these things. The cardboard box was a box that said, Fragile Furniture Do Not Open With a Knife. Uh, it was a cardboard box for a bassinet that was sold by J.C. Penney. They eventually tracked down who purchased this box. Uh, even though the store that it was purchased at was cash only, they found out who it was, and it turns out that that person had no connection to the boy. They also noticed that the young boy had hair that was recently cut, uh, for there was like pieces of hair still all over his body, and they realized that his nails were also trimmed as well. Even though there were signs of malnourishment on the child, uh, it was ultimately ruled that he was beaten to death. The investigators also took note of surgical scars on the ankle and groin, and he also had an L-shaped scar underneath his chin. Since the woods are generally like a harder place to find evidence just because of how big the woods can be and how treacherous the terrain can be at, at times, uh, they had about 270 police academy recruits come and search the area over and over again. They found a man's corduroy cap nearby. Uh, a, a local store owner recognized somebody that wore the hat. Uh, I think they came in the store alone. However, they cannot identify the man and the man could never be found. They also found a child's scarf and a white handkerchief that had the letter G in the corner. Ultimately, none of the items that were found really helped the investigation at all. So the police interviewed multiple orphanages, childcare places, hospitals and doctors trying to figure out if anybody knew who this child was. The public saw this as a very important case that they wanted to be solved as soon as possible. So the Philadelphia Inquirer printed out 400,000 pictures of the boy's likeness that were put up all around public areas as well. The boy's likeness was also put in gas bills and in newspapers just to find any attempt of anybody who knew this boy was. Another photo was also released by the police. Uh, in which the body was dressed and put in a seated position. The boy soon became known nationwide as the boy in the box. Uh, some people didn't like this name, so they call it America's Unknown Child as well. So both of these names kind of go hand in hand. And unfortunately, despite all of the efforts by police and the media trying to get as much information as they can about this boy, uh, the identity of the boy and the identity of the killer was unfortunately never found. However, we're going to jump a little bit into the future to April 2019 when a court ruled that investigators were able to exhume the body and do DNA testing on it. Since DNA technology today is so much better than it was in years past, uh, a lot of cold cases such as this one uh, were solved through DNA analysis. Several cousins of the boy in the box had their DNA already in a database, so the boy's identity was soon found out to be Joseph Augustus Sorelli. Joseph was born January 13th, 1953, which means that he was about four years old when he died. Investigators also identified his parents, uh, both of whom are 
deceased, as well as some living half-siblings uh, who remain nameless, obviously, due to their, you know, investigators wanted to keep their privacy. <laughs> this finding was initially discovered on November 30th of 2022 by the Philadelphia Police Department and was announced on December 8th of 2022, 65 years after the body was found. Captain Jason Smith stated that they do not know who killed the boy or the circumstances of how he passed. However, investigations would continue with, quote, we have our suspicions as to who may be responsible, but it would be irresponsible of me to share these suspicions as this remains an active and ongoing criminal investigation. In a 2007 interview with the New York Times, Elmer Palmer, who was the first officer to come onto the scene, stated that he and the fellow officers believed that this case would be solved very quickly at the time. And the irony behind that statement was that most of those officers that were on the scene uh, did not live to find out who the boy in the box actually was. One of the most popular and well-known theories of what happened to this boy was through a woman named Martha or simply known as M. Martha or M, I'm just gonna call her Martha, it's easier that way. Um, she stated that her mother purchased the boy from his birth parents in 1954 in the summer and the boy's name was Jonathan. This boy was unfortunately a subject to many forms of abuse for around two and a half years. The boy's life would unfortunately come to an end when one night the boy threw up his dinner of baked beans, which caused Martha's mother to become extremely upset and beat the child and smash his head repeatedly against the ground. At this point, he was only semi-conscious and he was given a bath and while he was given a bath, he died. At the time, the boy had distinctively long hair, which the mother cut to conceal his identity. And then her and Martha drove the body up to that road in Fox Chase. Allegedly, while preparing the body, a male motorist saw them and asked if they needed any help. So Martha's mom quickly told Martha to stand in front of their license plate so that the male motorist can see it while the mom kind of told him to leave, they didn't need help. The interesting thing about this story is that the police said it was actually kind of plausible. The coroner found remnants of baked beans in the child's stomach and said that his fingers were water wrinkled, which kind of has the connection to the bath. The story also was corroborated with a confidential testimony of a male witness in 1957 who stated that the body was placed in a box that was already at the scene. However, the police remained skeptical of Martha's claims because she has a very long history with mental illness. And when they interviewed neighbors of where Martha used to live, uh, they called her story ridiculous because there was never ever a boy that lived there. So yeah, I don't really know what to make of Martha's story. I just really thought it was interesting that there were a lot of kind of unknown information that was in Martha's story that the if only the investigators knew and the public didn't know. So, I don't know. I, I really don't know what to believe. The police said they know somebody, or they are investigating somebody in particular. So I'm very interested to see what, you know, comes of that. Obviously, they're not going to tell us unless they have, like, concrete proof. But, yeah, hopefully they figure that out soon. And, uh, yeah, so Joseph was originally buried in Potter's Field which is a burial ground for unknown people. After the discovery of his identity, he was reburied at Ivy Hills Cemetery in Cedar Brook, Philadelphia, which donated a large plot for the boy. The coffin, headstone, and funeral service was paid for by the son of the man who originally buried the boy in 1957, and Joseph's headstone reads, America's Unknown Child. And the city residents keep the boy's grave decorated with flowers and toys, a sentiment that I hope is continued in the future, for I believe that Joseph Augustus Sorelli is a name that we should all remember. Little Miss Nobody On July 31st, 1960, the partially buried body of a young girl was found in Sandwash Creek Bed off of Old Alamo Road in Congress, Arizona. It was discovered by Russell Allen, a school teacher in Las Vegas, while he was collecting rocks for his garden. I'm just going to read this because this is a long description. Uh, the girl was found with red shorts, buttoned blue blouse with a distinctive vertical linear pattern, 
adult sized rubber thong sandals that had been cut to fit her feet and fastened with le leather straps and her toes and fingernails were painted bright red. And there were also sections of clothing also recovered close to the grave. When investigating the scene, authorities also stated that they believed that whoever was responsible for burying this young girl made two separate attempts as well because there was two separate disturbances in the sand, which they believe were attempts at the individual or individuals trying to bury a grave or moving somewhere else. There were also evident tire impressions, which indicate that whoever was driving a vehicle drove off of Highway 93 to this location before turning around and leaving. There are also two sets of footprints found, uh, one of which was adult footsteps where they went to the scene and came back and possibly the footsteps of a child in sandals that only went there but actually didn't come back, which leads investigators to believe that this young girl was alive before being killed at this location and then buried. They also found a rusted and bloodstained knife nearby. However, they just don't know if this has anything to do with the crime. So I just thought I should throw that out there. I am now gonna tell you what the autopsy determined for this young girl. They determined that the body was a white girl, likely between the ages of five and seven. She was between three feet, six inches, and four feet and five inches, between 50 and 60 pounds, been dead for between one and two weeks before discovery, with brown hair, possibly dyed auburn, and a full set of milk teeth. The cause of death for this child was never really figured out. It was still determined a homicide regardless, even though there were no fractures or puncture wounds. However, the remains were charred. Investigators believe that after the girl's death, the perpetrators burnt the body. They don't believe that the girl died from the burning, so. However, due to said burning and the advanced state of decomposition, they could not create a composite sketch of what they believe the girl to look like. I'm now going to go through two different people that the police believe this little girl could be. The first person that the police believe this body could be is uh, Sharon Gallegos. Sharon was a four-year-old girl that was abducted 10 days before the body was found on July 31st, 1960. Sharon lived in Alamogordo, New Mexico with her mother, Guadalupe, her grandmother, two older siblings, and six other relatives, and they were stated to be a very tight-knit, close family. Sharon was described as feisty and happy-go-lucky, and she liked to play with her family and her friends in the neighborhood and help her family out by doing errands. On Sunday, July 17th, four days before her abduction on July 21st, a couple was observed in a dark green sedan uh, with two children in the back. Uh, one was a male with freckles and one was a smaller female. This family was at a church service that Sharon and her family was at. And after Sharon and her family left, this couple was observed to be asking a lot of people about the girl and her family. In the days leading up to her abduction, Sharon's family stated that she was very nervous and she just didn't seem like her normal self. One of the errands that the family would allow Sharon to do was go get groceries and it was one of her favorite things to do and apparently she did not want to do that anymore. And this dark green vehicle that I mentioned earlier was appearing more and more around the house and the family didn't really take notice, but Sharon did. Whenever she saw that vehicle, she became more and more distressed and would have a family member half like forcibly pick her up and carry her past because she would not walk past it by herself. Around July 19th, the female abductor went up to one of the neighbors of Sharon and asked about Sharon's mother. Uh, she asked questions like, do you have any kids? Uh, and specifically, does she have a young daughter? Uh, ask questions about her financial situation, stuff like that. And the neighbor was kind of weirded out about this. She was like, why are you asking so many questions about like her address and her family and stuff? And the female abductor said that she was planning on offering Sharon's mother a job. So then the neighbor didn't really think anything of it. At around 3 p.m. on July 21st of 1960, Sharon and her two cousins aged five and 11 were playing in the back alley in the backyard, like near her house. The couple pulled up in a quote unquote dirty green car, which is now believed to be a dark green 1951 or 52 model Dodge or Plymouth sedan. This couple offered Sharon to buy her candy or clothes if she got in the van with them. 
Sharon obviously refused, however, the female abductor grabbed her and pulled her into the van. The woman was described to be short, heavy set with glasses, with dirty blonde hair in her 30s. The man who was driving the car was described as a fair, thin Caucasian with a long nose and straight, sandy colored hair. The last time that the vehicle was seen was when it turned west onto 5th Street at a very high speed. The cousins alerted Sharon's mother as soon as they could, and Sharon's mother alerted the police. The police set up roadblocks at the Mexico and Texas border and searched every single car that fit the description, however they never found the little girl. At the time of the abduction, Sharon was two months away from her fifth birthday and was three foot six at the time with brown hair and she was wearing pink shorts and white shoes. The investigators strongly considered Sharon to be the identity of this little girl's body that was found because of the similar description and the similar date of abduction and the body being found. And even though that the body was found 800 kilometers away from where this abduction happened and the clothes changed, a lot can happen in 10 days. However, the authorities soon changed like the estimated age of the little girl that was found and said that the body was probably seven years old instead of like the four to six. So then Sharon was ruled out. And in March of 1961, another potential identity for the body was brought up. The potential identity for this girl was Deborah Jane Dudley, a four-year-old girl who went missing in Virginia. And before I go on with this, I don't understand why they would consider her a potential person when she was four, when they discarded the other one for being four. I, yeah, I mean, I don't know, I, I don't know. Deborah's seven-year-old sister, Carol Ann, had her body discovered wrapped in a blanket on February 9th, 1961. Carol Ann had died from malnutrition, exposure, and neglect from her parents. The police knew that Deborah was probably dead somewhere, however, they never were able to find her. So that's why they believed that Little Miss Nobody could be Deborah. However, Deborah's remains were later found in Southern Virginia, and her parents were charged for the murder of Deborah and Carol Ann. And once again, Little Miss Nobody's case went cold. However, much like in the case of The Boy in the Box, Little Miss Nobody's body was also exhumed in 2018 so that a DNA sample could be obtained. When this body was exhumed, uh, they were able to use this DNA testing to find out a better likelihood of what this little girl could have looked like. Uh, they figured out that this girl was probably between the age of three and six with being three foot six as well. The University of North Texas Center for Human Identification also created a forensic facial reconstruction of what they believe this child could have looked like. In January of 2022, the sample of the DNA was sent to Orthrem Inc., a corporation that uses DNA genealogy to find the identity of unknown people. The identity of Little Miss Nobody was soon figured out in February of 2022, but wasn't announced to the public until March 15th of 2022. It was soon announced that the identity of Little Miss Nobody was in fact Sharon Lee Gallegos. This is in fact the oldest case that the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children has ever helped to solve, with a difference of 62 years between discovery of the body and discovery of the identity of the body. And finally, the efforts to identify the abductors and murderers of Sharon are still ongoing. The Abduction of Melissa Highsmith On August 23rd, 1971, a single mother named Alta Apenteco released an ad in the local newspaper asking for a babysitter. She soon hired a woman named Ruth Johnson, whom she never met in person before and only met on the phone. So that night when Apenteco was already at work, her roommate handed 21-month-old Melissa to Ruth Johnson, who was described to be well-dressed while wearing gloves. Alta and her roommate lived in an apartment in East Seminary, Fort Worth, and they assumed that the babysitter wouldn't actually go that far, and she lived nearby. However, Ruth Johnson never returned with the child when she was supposed to. Uh, the family reached out and tried to contact Johnson. She never answered, so then they soon called the police. Fort Worth police and the FBI were both involved in trying to find where Ruth Johnson took the child, the police and FBI pretty much had nothing, uh, so they never really found her. The family never gave up looking for Melissa, though. They threw her birthday parties every November, 
and created a Facebook page dedicated on finding their child. In September of 2022, an anonymous tip came in that she could have been in the area of Charleston. However, this wasn't true, but this did ignite some more attention around the case. This prompted the family to submit a 23andMe DNA test, which actually helped them find Melissa. It turns out that Melissa grew up as Melanie in Fort Worth, where this whole crime happened. The family reached out to her via Facebook Messenger. Uh, obviously, she was very, you know, sus about people texting her and being like, you know, you're my family. Uh, but she eventually did do a 23andMe test, and turns out that that was her actual family. So Melissa reconnected with her family for Thanksgiving, 51 years after she was abducted. The family was rejoiced, and Melissa kind of gave some background of how she grew up. The people that raised her, she had a, I guess, a mom that treated her very well. However, she had an abusive stepfather, and they all lived in an RV. And uh, when she was 15, she left. After leaving, she was eventually able to get herself into the position that she is in today. Uh, she lives in her own apartment, and she looks back on her past, and you know, she she's very proud of how she was able to come up from basically nothing to how she is today. When the lady who raised her heard about the news of Melissa slash Melanie finding her real family, she reached out and said this. In 1972, she was a single mother with only a boy, and she always wanted a little girl. So an older lady said that she could not care for her relative's baby girl anymore, which was Melissa. So this older lady sold the baby for $500 to this lady. When Melissa found who her real family was, the lady that raised her said that she was so happy to hear that she was reunited with her family and wishes that she would not forget her other family. So yeah, that was three cold cases that were solved in 2022. I want to thank you guys for watching this video, and I'm sorry that the background's kind of boring compared to how it is. I don't know. Is, do you guys like my, my background, my apartment? I don't know. I don't know, I'm cutting off topic, my bad. Uh, but yeah, uh, sorry that this year I've been kind of off with my upload schedule. Uh, I'm going to try to become much more consistent, and I'm going to try to give the best content possible. Uh, my next video probably will be continuing the video game Smith and the Urban Legends Iceberg, even though those videos don't really seem to be viewed as much. Uh, I started it, I want to finish it, so I'm going to finish it. I'm going to do... Sprinkle in, I guess, that iceberg every once in a while so until I eventually finish it. But yeah, I want to wish you guys a happy New Year's. Um, I want to thank you guys for watching. And I want to thank you guys who have been here for a while for sticking around. And yeah, and if you want to, check out my Patreon and you could be up in... Okay, yeah, I gotta realize it's my right hand that goes on the left side of the screen. Whatever. But yeah, if you want to be with these beautiful people, uh, all you gotta do is join the Patreon. Uh, Tiers range from one dollar to fifteen dollars. Uh, if you want, check out my Twitter. If you want to come in contact with me, I like talking to people in my Discord. You know, come join. It's all—it's a lot of fun in there. And yeah, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. It helps out a lot. And yeah, um, I'm Fright from Frightopia, and thank you for watching. <laughs>